On this episode of Skeptico... If you go to the website, there's this big picture prominently displayed of this guy completely outfitted in this satanic kind of thing, right? So it's the thing, hey man, it's cool, we're all atheists, you know? You want to sign this little pact with Satan? It doesn't mean anything, right? Go ahead, sign it, you know? You want to perform these rituals? Hey, we're all atheists, it doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, there's a real mismatch here that I don't think is drawn enough attention. From the technocrat controller perspective, I mean, they're very aware of the fact that atheism and materialism and reductionism are not, they don't have the power to hold human belief for very long because they're not fulfilling, they're empty. And so humans are always going to be moving towards the transcendent. Now, from their vantage point, whether they acknowledge the belief in the transcendent, you know, whether they're just still rank atheists and materialists or agnostic or, or actual Luciferians or some form of occultist, you know, regardless, I think from their vantage point, pragmatically speaking, they view human psychology that way, that humans are just going to be worshiping something. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and on this episode, an interesting exploration of film and culture and geopolitics and even religion from the very interesting Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. So as this interview unfolds, you'll see that we go to a lot of, I think, new and interesting places that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about, including what might lie behind the atheistic materialistic science meme, and also a little bit of a revisit to Christian apologetics since since Jay happens to be an Orthodox Christian. And I say happens to be because you wouldn't really know that. He doesn't really kind of lead with that. And I mean, he's just a person with some really cool, smart ideas. It's really not about his religion, but I guess I kind of made it about his religion at times too, because that seems to be important in this discussion. And I will let you know that at the end of this exchange that Jay and I had, which I thought was very, you know, positive and, and great, even though we really kind of got into it, uh, I, I left feeling glad that, you know, we had this exchange. But we did talk about doing a follow-up, and I do plan to do that. As a matter of fact, I just did an interview follow-up on that today. That'll come out, and then I hope to have Jay back on to talk more about some of the biblical scholarship, Christian apologetics issue. So that is not weighted down in this interview, but will come in the future. Here's my interview with Jay Dyer. Today we welcome Jay Dyer to Skeptico. Jay is the creator of Jay's Analysis, a fascinating website, YouTube channel that tackles film analysis and philosophy, geopolitics, metaphysics, all sorts of really cool stuff that has a lot of overlap with the topics we've talked about on Skeptico. He's also the author of Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. Great book for anyone interested in looking at film from a deeper, esoteric, occulted perspective. It's a book that became quite popular, actually hit number one on one of the Amazon lists. So, Big congrats to Jay for that. Jay, it's great to have you on Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Well, you know, first of all, uh, I have to say, you know, anyone who produces the amount of content, quality content that you, that you do, I just am in awe of and I'm amazed you have great stuff. So much of it's free. You have uh, posts and podcast, tons of interviews that other people have done that you post. So there's a lot of great stuff on your website. Like I said, a lot of it's available for free. Even the book, Esoteric Hollywood, which is really packed with a ton of stuff, ton of footnotes, really a well done book. That's only 10 bucks on Amazon. So I don't know how you do it, but I'm glad you're doing it and putting it all out there. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm approaching probably in the next year or two, I think I'll have around a thousand uh, essays and articles that I've written over the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, most of them. And then I would uh, please 
request that if you do want to get the book, I know it's cheaper on Amazon, and if you have to do that, you can do that. But uh, Amazon's not that great for authors, so we really don't make anything when people get it on Amazon. So if you want to support me, what you can do is get the the book directly from me. And I know it's a little bit more, but I do offer uh, signed copies. And I think the book is, uh, you know, it's going to keep doing well. It's everybody loves it. I have ninety five percent, you know, positive ratings and almost i think 70 five star ratings across uh amazon us uk and goodreads so it, that's very good for you know only being out for about four months so um anyway but yeah if you if you would just get the book from jay's analysis directly from me and it's a lot better for the author but but yeah it's a lot of fun and uh i put out a lot of content because you know i pretty much have made this my full-time job for the last year and a half. So that kind of frees me up to, to work on it every day. And then of course, you know, when you're your own boss, you end up working (laughs) 12 hours a day, you know, you're working a lot more than, than you do when you're working for somebody else, because, you know, everything's on your shoulders. So. Absolutely. Totally get that. So that's very cool. And I hear what you're saying. And also there's a subscription uh, there's a sc- subscription level that you have on the website. Again, there's a ton of content there for free, but if people want to support you, they can do that through the website as well. And I encourage anyone who's interested to just go check it out. And actually, that's one of the challenges I had in putting together this interview because there is so much out there. I want to pick and choose the stuff that's, I guess, most relevant to Skeptico listeners, has the most okay. overlap with what we've done. And then I want people to get to know you. And if they like you and what you're doing, they can do what we all do, which is go sample a bunch of your stuff and then say, right. hey, I want this to continue. How do I make sure this guy keeps doing what he's doing? And that's when I think the support really kicks in. So Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, there's uh, the subscription service is actually the main means of of how I make a living. I mean, the book helps, but, um, and then of course the TV show this year, but, um, yeah, the subscription service, it, it's, there's a pretty good sized archive. Of course it's growing and I, I put out something subscription based every week. And so you get like the first hour free and then, you know, the full two hours for uh, a meager, uh, $5 a month or $60 a year. So everybody enjoys it. I have again on the subscription, side of things i have about 95 percent approval everybody likes that so and they come back you know even people who uh, cancel i notice quite a few of them actually come back after a few months so uh so everybody who you know is into what i do likes it a lot and it's just been great i think the internet's uh amazing for you know people who want to do their own thing in their own little niche you know you can really if you, if you work at it you can make a living out of it that is amazing. And it's it's important new way to kind of foster this long tail journalism and analysis and all that stuff. But hey, you know where I thought we might start off with in a great cross sec or intersection between a topic you've talked about and one that's near and be- dear to us here on Skeptico is the idea of scientism, you know, and because from Richard Dawkins and the new atheist to Charles Darwin. We could even start with the story, a great story I heard about how your editor even flinched at your treatment of Darwin in esoteric Hollywood because he is this demigod, god among gods, among science. And it's really when you deconstruct it, there's, well, there's a lot there to deconstruct. Just dive in anywhere you want. Yeah, well, in that I, I love to. I, I, I'm a huge uh, critic of scientism. That makes up a big portion of what I deal with uh, throughout a lot of the essays. And the reason for that is that you know I, like the rest of us, I went through the school system and then the academic realm. And you know, you're you're just sort of beat over the head with this nonstop. You know, it's like from womb to <laughs> grad school. You know, you've been told over and over and over that. And the scientific method is really the only way to uh, to approach the world. It's the most reliable uh, meaning or, or source for meaning, and and that's where it sort of steps over its bounds. Because when we understand what the scientific method actually is, that it's simply a tool for investigating and hypothesizing, and you know, coming to conclusions about the natural world, uh, that's really all it can do. 
uh, by the nature of what it is. Uh, it's and, not a position statement. It's not it, materialism. It's not saying correct. you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe. It's just saying, here's a tool set. It's a tool set, right? It would be like trying to, you know, make a screwdriver into some sort of symbol of deity. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a tool. It can't, it can't function that way. So, uh, it doesn't have the ability to grant grand narratives, and that's what it's become in our day because it's really been something that has that that I think they realized a long time ago could be used. Uh, for social engineering and propaganda, and that's really what it functions as now. And um, give us some examples, some specific ways that you've seen, how, in terms of how that's brought forward, either in film or through these characters we see, like Dawkins in the New Atheists, or anything that bubbles up to the top of your mind. Uh, well, I mean, the greatest example is uh, what just happened in the last couple of weeks, where. People uh, pulled up old clips of Bill Nye and his old show talking about how chromosomes, uh, you know, give you biological identity. You can't; <laughs> it's kind of determined. You don't really get to choose that. You can't change your chromosomes. Uh, and then now he's done this new show, which is obviously just blatant, uh, you know, transgender propaganda, saying that gender is a spectrum and it's not determined by biology. So, so that's one of the, the clearest <clears throat> examples I can think of that probably of all time that just happened within the last few weeks. Uh, junk DNA is another good example. You, there are people that put together clips of Richard Dawkins just completely contradicting himself, not just being in error about junk DNA, but actually lying about what he said, because uh, there's clips from him, you know, 10 years ago saying junk DNA is of course one of the greatest evidences we have for the proof of evolution. And then now that there's a uh, not quote junk DNA, he says the exact opposite and claims that he's always said that, right? <laughs> the fact that we don't have junk DNA is one of the strongest proofs of evolution. I've always said this. Uh, and he's just flat out contradicts himself. So, uh, you know, these are guys who are put forward as pop scientists and, you can even look into the character of Einstein and find a lot of discrepancies. He was very controversial at his time. There was a lot of accusations of plagiarism. Um, so what I'm getting at is just that these people are kind of put forward as uh, pop stars for uh, not the scientific method or, or anything like that, but really scientism. And once you understand that it's a world, you know, a lot of, by the way, this is not like a theory that I've come up with a lot of very well-reasoned philosophers and philosophers of science, which is a whole other discipline um, that's that's very crucial, I think, to understand, which I, I did a lot of research into that in my grad school and undergrad days. Uh, they, they've critiqued this for a long time, and so the irony here is that, that scientism and naive empiricism are actually views that have been completely dissected for <laughs> like dozens of times over for many, many years. Uh, but it's almost kind of like a vampire. I think one of my professors said that it, it's like this uh, vampire that just keeps coming back. It doesn't die <laughs> no matter how many times you shoot it or you know, dismember it. It just kind of like magically comes back to life and you know, people still fall for uh, something that is just, just so easily deconstructed. I mean, you can very, very easily show the incoherency and the inconsistency and the contradictions involved in bare naive scientism well especially when you introduce scientific materialism which is something we've talked a lot about on this show when you really break it down and look at the proposition behind that and also the links to atheism which are just stark i mean you you can't really separate the two because the the philosophical agenda is the same it's materialism is telling us this is all there is we are just what we see we are nothing more as human beings there's no meaning to anything and then that is part and parcel with the idea of atheism it just goes hand in hand i should say it's hand in hand with the idea of atheism and i think that that's been engineered in from the beginning. I mean, if you look at Darwinism, which there's some debate about whether Darwinism really implied the social Darwinistic survival of the fittest, and I think we've gone back and forth on that, but I think ultimately the answer is yes, that was the design from the beginning to kind of, of course promote was. this and idea. It's in the title of the book. Go ahead. Well, I'm just agreeing with you. I'm saying it. Obviously, it is. It's in the title of the book, "The Favored Races." I mean, uh, you know, he's it's it's the product of uh, 
you know, Malthusian Victorian uh, England, right? Uh, it's the idea that the Anglo-American establishment, the British Empire, was the apex of history, and that uh, uh, this th- there's really no other model by which the world should be governed. And you can't really, I don't think, understand Darwin and Darwinism outside of uh, the ethos from which it comes. Right. Uh, this is another error that a lot of uh, people involved in scientism make is that they assume that there's a uh, neutrality that, that, that science, right. you know, some somehow has magical access to neutrality and you know, there's no cognitive dissonance. There's no bias involved in quote science and that there's just brute factuality and it doesn't require interpretation. Uh, and that we, we, you know, we just, the scientist, when he dons the lab coat, just magically ob- obtains, uh, you know, objectivity to a degree that no other human being in any other field has, which is curious because, uh, you know, in my view, the the uh, the the real science, I would say, happens most of the time in fields like engineering, and you know where you have real development based on actual principles that occur in the world. Now, that's not to say that nobody's successful in biology or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that what most people think science is isn't really science. It's more of a, uh, again, a propaganda tool of uh, really older worldviews that, that that are kind of dead. Uh, it's, it's this lingering Enlightenment era notion uh, that we can understand the natural world without any kind of presuppositions or biases and that there are just brute facts. And, and there've been so many advancements in, for example, human anthropology or ethnography or, or anything to do with studying uh, belief systems and worldviews that shows that there's no such thing as this privileged neutral position. Well, that's, that's kind of fundamental to physics of the last hundred years and the quantum physics revolution that everyone wants to get away from and say, oh, you're going to sprinkle the quantum woo-woo stuff. Well, no. I mean, if you just go back and look at what quantum physicists were most concerned about 100 years ago, they're the same issues. So Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and all the rest were saying, hey, guys, we've run into a, a problem here. It seems like there's nothing there until we're observing it and consciousness is fundamental and we have the kind of pyramid backwards. It's not matter that's generating consciousness. It's somehow in some way we don't understand consciousness generating matter. And then what they did with the engineering part and what we've done over and over again is say, well, let's ignore the philosophical problems there and just yes. shut up and calculate. And hey, that's cool. You know, we generated a lot of really cool stuff and cool medicine and all the rest of that. But if I could return one minute, one of the things I think is fascinating about the Charles Darwin thing is, you know, you can sit down and you can explain to anyone in less than a minute how the Darwinism breaks down because the survival of the fittest thing we all know that's not true. It's really the non-survival of the least fit, right? So if you're a, a, a pack of gazelles, you don't have to be the fastest one. Just don't be the slowest one. I mean, even if you accept Darwinism for what it is, that's all he was saying. And then the second thing he was saying is it's not about survival of the individual. It's about survival of the group, because if you just survive as an individual, that doesn't do you much good. But if your pack survives, if your group survives, if you accept Darwinism, even basically what it is, you have to understand that it's the survival and perpetuation of that gene set of the group. So when you just look at that and anyone thinks about that and they go, well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. And then you step back and go, well, how did we get into this survival of the fittest, social engineering, we must dominate everyone else kind of thing. And then it's clearly for political and and control reasons in terms of supporting a particular political ideology. I mean, it's pretty obvious, I think. Yeah. And that there are, you know, a host of problems with that worldview. Uh, I have a bunch of talks and uh, articles and essays that I've written about it where I, I deconstruct it on many levels. Um, I, I do in a few essays deal with extensive kind of scientific type type argumentation, but I don't usually focus on that because my training was more so as a philosopher. So I'm usually interested in the metaphysical and philosophical critiques of Darwinism and, and 
one thing I would say is that if you start at the 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 philosophical level and you look at it and you say, okay, what is this worldview, or what do most people who have this worldview tend to to say about man and about the external world and about history and and you know, the process of uh, objects and, and and phenomena and so forth and and what you tend to find is a lot of people kind of spouting the same stuff so I, I think i can safely group most people in that that type of worldview under you know the categories of reductionism and materialism and naturalistic uh, process and so forth process philosophy maybe and what you find is that you can kind of group all of those views together under a lot of the same basic presuppositions. So when I approach things at my in my work philosophically, I do what's called a presuppositional critique. And I, I, I do that because I believe that the way that humans and human psychology functions, that it, it interprets the world according to a kind of a, a framework. And if we, if we have, say, faulty presuppositions, then we have glasses that we're going to read the world through uh, incoherently and well and and so if i put a bunch of evidence in front of somebody say that that i think contradicts their worldview uh, if i've not challenged their presuppositions then all of those evidences are going to be read according to their ma their founding maxims right they're going to they're just going to reinterpret the evidences that i put in front of them uh, according to what they already believe is the case so what what needs to be done i think is to kind of dig a little bit deeper and kind of uproot the foundational premises which they most likely never question and i've had in my lifetime probably 300 debates with people with this kind of worldview and you notice all the same patterns you start to notice that well they've never actually you know maybe they never took a philosophy class it never occurred to them to question these these kinds of things uh, but they never thought about something like uh, a good example is identity over time. Now, this is a kind of a perennial philosophy question. How does an object in the world retain its identity? What does it mean to say that that object is that thing and that it, it remains that thing, whatever it may be, over time? Now, that sounds maybe a little obtuse or a little out there, but this is pretty fundamental, actually, because, you know, when we go about our daily business or when we interact with other people, you know, we think, so and so is that person. Right? Bob is Bob, and he was the same Bob he was, you know, five years ago when he was younger, and you know when he was a baby, he was that same Bob, even though his body has completely changed. So we have this sort of underlying assumption, for example, of identity uh, and the self, right, over time. Now, none of that can actually be shown or demonstrated empirically. There's there's absolutely no way to to prove empirically that there was a, the same self uh, over time, for one, because you don't have access to the past, right? I mean, you, you might have a video recording of something of the, uh, you know, the, of Bob as a baby or something, but you don't have direct empirical access to Bob's self, right? Or whoever he was as a person. I don't also have access to my own self, right? But when we interpret the world, when we do science, when we do anything, any kind of human activity, we're presuming the existence of a self. I mean, the fact that I'm, you know, engaging in this chat with you assumes that I have some sort of self or conscious identity. It assumes that you do, and that we can have meaningful, rational intercommunication, right? But at no point in this discussion, or at no point in any sort of lab, can you ever possibly demonstrate that there is a self. Uh, nor can you demonstrate that any sort of object out there in the world uh, has identity over time. It's now, so some people would say, and some skeptics have said, such as David Hume and, and these different philosophers, they say, well, the, well, then that out with all that, right? We, we just can't know. We can never know that there's a self. We can never know that there are objects out in the world. And or take it one step further, right? I mean, Daniel Dennett, consciousness is an illusion. You know, I mean, just... It's, in other words, what I'm saying is that the people who adopt those kind of presuppositions like reductionism and materialism and that all reality is just perpetual flux and they don't really bite the bullet is what i'm trying to say like they like to kind of play a little game with themselves and with others well that where they'll right. they'll adopt that view and kind of argue with it and and pretend like they believe that but in their daily life they believe that they exist you know neil degrasse tyson 
I'm sure, uh, likes getting a paycheck for being Neil deGrasse Tyson, doesn't he? So, I mean, that kind of assumes that he he's that person, right? right? So he doesn't actually act and live as if he believes all of these presuppositions that he's preaching every day. Uh, and so what I do is kind of dig down and I say, look, all of this is, can be reduced to complete absurdity because uh, the, the out, outworking of your view uh, when you attack things like God or the existence of anything immaterial or conceptual and you say that none of that exists, well, that means that Neil deGrasse Tyson as a self doesn't exist. I mean, this is, so this is just ultimately absurd. And it's a flat out n- a contradiction. There's no way around it. Uh, and, and I think that if we really pressed uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye or any of these people, I don't think they would have any kind of answer because, you know, they say in interviews, they say, I don't care about philosophy. It doesn't matter. I mean, these are the kind of real questions that that I think are absolutely legitimate. What are you talking about if you're going to sit here? And by the way, these people, they'll talk all, of the, all day about, you know, phony liberal causes and, and human rights and this kind of crap. Why would you talk about human rights if you don't even believe that there's a consciousness or a self? And so it's just a bunch of double talk and kind of word games. Oh, uh, I, I, is what totally, a lot of, I totally know, agree I, with you. I like the way philosopher Albert Camus put it. He said there's only one philosophical question, suicide. Yeah, that's the end result of uh, the, the nihilistic existential. Well, no, but it's a, it, you could take it as that way, but could you also take it as kind of a little bit of a jab in terms of if you start with that presupposition, that dogma, then why perpetuate the, the why perpetuate the nothingness? Why perpetuate the game? And I think that gets to your point of they don't really believe that when pressed. And that's why the consciousness is an illusion uh, kind of meme is really fallen out of favor and people uh, talk about Dennett, you know, the, the modern yeah. people like Sam Harris and, uh, and those people talk about Dennett and they go, well, we're not sure Dan is really serious about that. Like no one in their right mind could really be serious about that. And then they kind of try and get into panpsychism or this emergent quality of consciousness, which is really just kind of some, trying to find some wiggle room to the idea that they're, that consciousness is fundamental, which we can get there. But, you know, this is your turf and philosophy we could talk about all day. But if I can, let me shift the focus a little bit, because one of the links that I think is really interesting, and you cover many, many ways, and it's hard to pin down where exactly you've kind of honed in on this, but that is the link between atheism and the occulted secret worlds of, you know, Luciferianism, Satanism, all of that stuff. Because there's a link there that I think hasn't been adequately explored. Because again, it's a case where these guys are kind of saying two things. On one hand, they're saying, hey, we're this atheist, there's nothing out there. And on the other hand, they're kind of embracing a lot of that occult practices that are very steeped in a whole spiritual realm, extended consciousness realm. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jay? I do, absolutely. I, I've, I've been meaning eventually to get to this, but I just haven't had really the time to approach it properly and do it justice. And, and that is, is precisely what you're getting at, that I don't really think uh, the new atheists and, and atheism in this, in this last few decades has really been popularized. I don't think that is intended to be the final destination. I, I think it's a halfway house that's kind of been put out there to lead people down a Pied Piper's path, basically. Uh, and I, I see that as a kind of alchemical progression. So if you read the works of, say, Michael Hoffman, he'll talk about uh, how the alchemical process involves taking a thing and then just kind of breaking it down, disintegrating it, um, calcifying it and so forth and then then you recreate it into a new form transmutation basically and i think that uh, the the phase or fad of atheism comes at the late stage of societal breakdown and religious breakdown philosophical breakdown and i don't believe that these breakdowns are natural or 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 are or are organic i think that they're for the most part kind of imposed from a top down uh, oligarchic social engineering type uh, perspective, technocratic perspective, basically. And so, what what I think had to happen was is that they, they had to 
gradually sort of break down traditional notions of uh, of family and morals. And you, you get a Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells actually talking about this. They talk about how they would have to sort of break down man, stamp him out. Uh, you know, Bertrand Russell talks about stamping out free will, stamping out man's spirit. Uh, which, by the way, why would you have to stamp it out if the spirit doesn't exist? Which is right. an interesting question for uh, Russell. But um, you know, Aldous Huxley says the same thing. He said that we, the the will would have to be broken, and that man would have to be removed from his pedestal and made to seem meaningless in the midst of a chaotic, meaningless universe. And so, once you, I think, once you see through this facade that's really been sold to everyone through pop culture and through pop music and all this kind of stuff, you can begin to see how. And through science, right? Exactly. You can begin to, well, at the end, that, that actually comes up, uh, as I point out in the book, there's a great section in Brave New World where Huxley admits this uh, because some of the characters in the novel realize that the scientism that dominates the world's socialist government in the novel, they realize that it's, it's fraudulent and they come to, the world socialist ruler, one of 10, Mustafa Mon, and they say, hey, there are discoveries that actually disprove your materialism and your scientism. And he says, oh, yeah, we, we know that. We've, we've known that for a long time. And they're like, why, why are you suppressing this? And he's like, well, because that's what has to be. You know, the people are never going to accept this. They're never going to. Uh, they're never going to be raised beyond their basically animalistic state. You're wasting your time trying to get people to understand things about metaphysics or things about the spirit or free will or any of that stuff or arts or, uh, and, and, and so John, the savage is uh, basically that. So you're saying that scientism that you promote is a religion. And he says, absolutely. There's a scientific orthodoxy that's promoted top down. That's what the guy, the controller in the novel literally says. So here's one of the most formative, uh, thinkers brains, I guess you could say of the 20th century, you know, intimately connected to the Royal society to, the creation of the UN and UNESCO. Uh, and he's basically saying what I'm saying. He's saying that it's a fraud. Scientism is, is a fraud, but it can be promoted as the new religion. And that's why in the novel that you have this sort of a goose comp style, fake religion that's created a, a civic religion based around scientism. So, I mean, everything is in brave new world, by the way, if you want to just see the whole uh, plan laid out, uh, that's where they're going. And, and, and science is the religion in the novel, not science, strictly speaking, truly speaking, but scientism. And, and Jay, you're really saying a couple of things there that I want to pick up on, because you're saying, yeah, scientism and science and materialism is religion. We get that. But the other thing you're saying, and you're open to at least, is this idea that it's really a way station to something different, to Luciferianism, Satanism, occultism. And, you know, let me just tell you a little story that I ran across. Uh, there's this guy, Dr. Richard Wiseman, extremely popular British psychologist. At some point, he had some phony baloney title of, you know, the guy, the point person for psychology education for the UK or something like that. He's been on the show a couple times. He's an outspoken skeptic. So he's in the face of all these people who are interested in parapsychology or near-death experience or anything in this extended consciousness realm. And he's, he's also uh, an outspoken atheist, of course. But here's the twist. Here's what I found when I looked into this guy. And I think it, it hits exactly on your point. He's also one of the founders of the Edinburgh Society. And if you go to the to the website, I want to read this for you because it's so telling. We stage events for those of curious disposition. Our past evenings have involved the performance of magic, optical illusions, experiments into fear, investigations into death, attempts to contact spirits, and summoning the devil. So here it is. And if you go to the website, there's this big picture prominently displayed of this guy completely outfitted in this satanic kind of thing, right? So it's the thing, hey, man, it's cool. We're all atheists, you know? You want to sign this little pack with Satan? It doesn't mean anything, right? Go ahead, sign it, you know? You want to perform these rituals? Hey, we're all atheists. It doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, there's a real mismatch here that I don't think is drawn enough attention, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the person that you're talking about, but uh, that is a, a trend, and that, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is that um, you, you uh, the, from the technocrat 
controller perspective, I mean, they're very aware of the fact that atheism and materialism and reductionism are not, they don't have the power to hold human belief for very long because they're not fulfilling, they're empty. And so humans are always going to be moving towards the transcendent. Now, from their vantage point, whether they acknowledge the belief in the transcendent, you know, whether they're just still rank atheists and materialists or agnostic or, or actual Luciferians or some form of occultist, you know, regardless, I think from their vantage point, pragmatically speaking, they view human psychology that way, that humans are just going to be worshiping something. And so you get amongst, amongst a lot of them, that kind of a goose Comtean type perspective where they, I think they generally think that they can uh, erect and concoct a new religion for the future. Uh, now, this is of course what you know, the UN has been involved in with, a lot of the ecumenical projects over the last hundred years back to the first one in like 1893 or four in Chicago that kind of kicked off the ecumenical movement. And then you understand that when you look into who funded that and who was behind all that, that it's, you know, it's these big families, it's the Rockefellers, et cetera, uh, you know, who had a big stake in the UN UNESCO. And, and that's why you see that push for this sort of uh, creation of a new global religion. And what I'm getting at is just that the popularization of atheism is really just one of those phases or stages uh, on the process towards that. And you actually have Masonic authors kind of writing about this at times, kind of giving away a little bit of the game and saying, you know, we, we can actually kind of maybe wreck uh, Christian religion and, and Islamic religion. And, and then on the, the long haul, we can get everybody towards a technocracy where you have this kind of uh, a Luciferian approach. And so my, in my view, I think they probably are testing out different possibilities. I, th I don't think that the alien mythology has really gone as well as maybe they thought it would, but uh, I, I've looked into a lot of really solid academic approaches to the UFO phenomenon. And you'll find Brookings Institute papers from a few decades ago that will actually say that the UFO phenomenon was intended to that basically break down traditional Western theology. Now they mentioned basically all the religions, Islam, uh, Judaism, Christianity, but they really see Christianity as the one that they, you know, I guess, cause it's the most prominent, you know, in, in the West in Western civilization as the one that really needed to be break broken down. Uh, and so, you know, b back in the sixties and seventies, you know, Brookings Institute was saying that uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe the UFO phenomenon could do that. Uh, now I don't know that it's been that successful, but, uh, you know, there's other possibilities of what could be done. They could, they might try to. And we don't know, to be fair, whether that's a co-opting of a real phenomenon or if it's a completely manufactured phenomenon. And they're just a rat's nest of stuff to pull apart there. Right, right. I'm not trying to say that I know everything about the UFO phenomenon. I mean, I think there are anomalies in, in you know, stellar phenomena that we don't explain or we, we can't explain or don't know about or. Yeah, I'm not trying. I'm just saying what that paper says that they might try to do. Um, uh, and I can give you the book if you want to reference that. The book is uh, The Lure of the Edge by Denzler, The Scientific Passions of Religious Belief and the Pursuit of UFOs. Um, and she's kind of an academic just looking at this phenomenon. And she, again, the reason I bring that book up is just that she notes many times in there how. Uh, useful this is for religions. And so I think that you can look at the CIA's involvement in uh, UFO cults. Okay. That has been pretty, pretty well <laughs> documented for many years now. I don't think there's a lot of dispute over that, but uh, I think that you can probably surmise. And again, I haven't taken the time to dig into this, but uh, if I, if I recall, there is some connection to uh, funding, for skeptical movements uh oh yeah know, oh definitely and i think i think these entities have a lot of um you know probably foundation money and that kind of stuff so so they're not actually skeptics and i think that one of uh one of my friends accurately stated it that they're pathological skeptics and so the irony here is that those worldviews are actually preset and pre-programmed to again interpret the data according to the quote skeptic worldview. <laughs> so well, well, and, and that's one manifestation of it. The other is that it's pure psyop. I mean, just step back. Yes. There's status quo supporters up and down, you know? So you get to something like 
climate change, if you will, where you say, okay, well, let's look at the skeptical perspective. And it's, no, now all of a sudden, the skeptical perspective switches over to the other side, because what it's really about is promoting, defending the status quo. It's the dog on a chain. You know, it's the barking dog that they can put out there. And what I've found through, you know, kind of the investigation of parapsychology, psi and consciousness is that what scientists do is they hide behind that, right? So they can be the barking dog out front. And then scientists can kind of come in and say, well, you know, we're trying to be reasonable about this, all the rest. And meanwhile, you have the barking dog out there that you can't get past. But I think that's past. I mean, I think the skeptical thing if you will, is over. And I think people are on to the pseudo skeptical reality that that's really there. I, I hope so. Uh, I've had a couple of these skeptics try to write big pieces about me, uh, which where they're completely dishonest in uh, attributing all kinds of things to me that I don't. They're completely dis Well, th they yeah. have their, the, the ethos is the end justifies the means, right? right? So it's just the whole social warrior thing we see now. It's like, hey, I've been victimized. So therefore, anything I do is justified because your message is done. It, it's just a twisted kind of thing that we've seen over and over again. It gets real political really fast, but that's well, the way it and is. And I, I think that the, one of the clearest proofs of, um, of it being a psyop in social engineering is the sort of caving of many of these new atheists to promoting the the alien idea now regardless of what you believe about aliens or ufos the fact that you know something that was laughed at and sneered at by the skeptic community 20 years ago uh, you know you can go back and find old uh, magazine copies of skeptic magazine with michael Shermer and these guys and you know they'll, they'll just debunk ufos and aliens oh but now you know stephen hawking and and richard dawkins can talk about yeah, but panspermia and panpsychia and the idea of an of an emergent, just a repackaged pantheism as the the new approach. Um, so that to me is is just laughable because you know they're again completely contradicting themselves from a few decades ago, what they were absolutely certain about, right? That that's, that this is a ridiculous uh, stage phenomenon. It's a joke. It's a hoax. So yes. and now they're but but it, but that blends very well with Darwinism. You know that the idea that that were created by aliens and all this kind of stuff. And again, I mean, it just, it just sort of begs the question that, that what is considered superstition or, um, or what we're skeptical about setting the parameters of right. what we're allowed to be skeptical about is completely arbitrary by these people. Well said, setting the parameters. So let, let's move on to another topic. And I appreciate that these are maybe not totally down what you cover a lot, but I think again, if people check out, no, Jay's this is great. Work, I'm I'm so tired of doing you know, the, <laughs> the same interviews over and over. So I, this well, good, great. but but I want to encourage people to check out Jay's work. I mean, like the geopolitical stuff, fascinating. I just ran, I just stumbled across really the whole thing that you did recently on North Korea and the fake photographs. And I know it gets conspiratorial to some people and a lot of skeptical listeners. As soon as it sounds conspiratorial, they're like, I'm out of here. You know, I can't deal with it, which it, I don't want to say it's OK because it's really not OK. But it, I get that that's where people are coming from. But like that stuff was just brilliant. And it's completely off topic with anything we're going to talk about today, as is a lot of the movie analysis you do. I mean, just about any movie someone can think of that has this meaningful connection to uh, society or philosophical big picture issues, you've done a breakdown of it. And I want to encourage people to go check that out, even though we might not deal with that in depth during mm -hmm. this interview. Briefly on the North Korea thing, I'll say that, um, you know, most people have received that, that pretty fairly well, I think, over the last uh, – I wrote that uh, article several years ago, and, you know, since then, and then the recent videos that I've done, that's probably had, I don't know, 30, 20 or 30,000 views, which is not that big of a deal, but uh, it, I'm surprised that it was as well received because um, I, I think a lot of people are still caught in the mindset that we – live in this world of battling nation states and you know I'm, I'm still in a learning process myself i'm kind of a young guy i don't claim to be a geopolitical expert uh, for me it's just a, a learning process as well so you know I, I really dove into geopolitics in my 
grad school period. Um, I was kind of forced into that when I was when I was writing my thesis, and I already had some interest in it with you know listening to talk shows and and talk radio and all of which is kind of watered down and sanitized. But you know the more you get into studying espionage and studying the history of geopolitical maneuvers, it becomes really fascinating. It's kind of a big it puzzle. Is puzzle piece but but what you start to realize when you get into the big tomes like tragedy and hope uh by dr carol quigley is that a lot of what has been going on in the last you know post uh, world war ii cold war era a lot of it is is theatrical uh, now that's not to say that and, and i have a lot of people who give me flack over this so i have to be be clear about what i'm saying i'm not saying that there aren't people who die in wars or that there's not you know, CIA people who bust uh, Russian spies or that Russians don't at times bust <laughs> Western agents. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen on out there in the world. What I'm saying is that when you get to the highest levels of, you know, who are the wealthiest people in various countries, you know, who are the billionaire oligarchs in Russia, uh, you know, how, how wealthy is Kim Jong-un? You know what I mean? How wealthy is Castro? Uh, you know, who's running the United States? When you start looking at it from that perspective and you and when you've studied mafia and the mob and how they worked and you start to see that it's really big cartels that that are running things. And when you understand, as that recent study was done, and I, I'm not I don't put that big of a deal or big of an emphasis on peer reviewed studies. But, you know, there was that recent peer reviewed study about uh, corporate control. And I think there was a whole TED talk done on it. And it basically demonstrates that there's a, a network of, you know, a, a select number of corporations and shareholders and 600 men. Interlocking directors. And exactly. That basically control, you know, the, the, the global market. So that is. But hold on. Again, that's just going to freak people out. I tell you what, I want to leave that topic, but I want to leave it with one tidbit that might spark curiosity to go check out Jay's work on the North Korea thing. And that's. Commodore 64. So if you're a computer buff, that's all I'm going to say. But look for Commodore 64 and, and check that out. And then if we can, let's let's move on because I got some cool stuff about consciousness that I really want to dip into. And tr Yeah, just one last point. I'll just say that, that uh, you know, I'm not making a definitive statement on North Korea. I'm just kind of throwing a possibility out there. And I'm saying that maybe... Um, the, the ultimate thesis is similar to uh, Servando Gonzalez, who's an intelligence and an analyst, by the way. He's not just some conspiracy theorist. He, he wrote a famous book called uh, Psychological Warfare in the New World Order. And, and in that book, he, he poses the thesis that maybe some of these so-called villains like uh, Hugo Chavez or Castro, and I'm including maybe Kim Jong-un, maybe these people are allowed to remain in these regions for the justification of pentagon foreign policy and that's really the, the thesis here so it's not saying that they're that they're not bad guys that they're not villains that they're not tyrants it's just saying that they're uh tyrants on a leash basically and they they justify oh we'll see we've got to actually have six to eight hundred you know u.s bases everywhere because well we'll we got to keep a watch on castro we got to keep a watch on kim jong-un you see what i'm saying absolutely one of the things I want to pick up on is, you know, we're talking about the skeptics and this game that's being played with the, the new atheism and then whatever the occulted uh, spirituality is that, that's behind that. The other purpose, I think, for that is to kind of just keep us spinning our wheels, if you will, and to keep science spinning its wheels. If you look at frontier science and people who really want to explore what consciousness might really mean and near-death experience, for example, where there's some real science, uh, reincarnation, there's real science at the University of Virginia, people doing it. So I think part of the agenda is to stifle that, you know, to keep Absolutely. that from really yeah. going anywhere. What are your thoughts? Have you looked into those, that science that is attempting to map out that extended consciousness realm, that spiritual realm. And do you have any thoughts on near-death experience, reincarnation, and, and, and whether we can approach that from a, sci a scientific basis, in a real scientific basis, like we're talking about, the scientific methodology, the scientific spirit of inquiry? Uh, yeah. Um, 
you ever seen the movie Flatliners? <laughs> no, sure, <I'm> sure. <laughs> the bad movie, but uh, but no, I'm kidding. Um, yes, I, I am familiar with uh, you know you have like Rupert Sheldrake, who I think has a lot of really interesting insights. Um, I, I tend to approach things from uh, an orthodox perspective, and so I have uh, an essay that I wrote about the f- the fractured psyche that kind of gets into that, and uh, there's a um, an Orthodox uh, guy, famous theologian named uh, Metropolitan Herothios Vlachos, and he has books on or- Orthodox psychotherapy that gets into this notion, interestingly, of the split or divided psyche. Uh, and I think that this is something that religions have talked about for a long time, um, you know, not just Christian theology or Eastern Orthodox theology, but other religions have posited this thesis too. And, you know, what modern quote science wants to do so often is, is basically toss out any kind of insights or knowledge that might be gained from wisdom or tradition, which is really kind of absurd because if you, if you think about it, science itself, as well as logic is not something that comes to us through a vacuum. Uh, I mean, we, we get this as a, an inheritance from, at least for us, from, you know, Aristotle and the Western tradition of philosophy. You know, Aristotle was a, a more, a more of a natural scientist, you might say. Uh, and I'm not trying to exalt Aristotle. I'm just saying that, you know, we don't think about the fact that this, that, that symbolic logic comes to us, you know, as an inheritance of a tradition, actually. Um, so there, I think there are a lot of insights that can be gained to this kind of stuff in in theology and in religion and spirituality. And so when I, if I'm, if I'm going to approach the possibility of scientific evidence for things like the psyche or things like, uh, you know, out of death experiences or consciousness in different modalities or planes of existence, I think that the, that there would have to be a reorientation of how we view evidences and the science of the self. So what do you mean about that? What do you mean? Right. So what, what earlier when I was talking about, for example, the notion of um, the identity of the self over time and how, you know, that's kind of a problem for the reductionist materialist. Um, what I believe is that there's actually a, a kind of argumentation, a logical argumentation or proof that shows us how those things are. Uh, and this is what's called a transcendental argument. Now I, I, argue and I believe very firmly that this is a valid form of logic. Um, so it's not exactly the same as symbolic logic because it's a little bit more f- fundamental. And so it's kind of asking a question at a meta level to make, to make it clear. So for example, a meta level question would be, and this is actually, this actually happens in mathematics and philosophy. This is not just me making this up. So like if we were to ask the question, um, how does logic work, right? I mean, we use logic, but then if we step back a little bit from maybe a God's eye perspective and say, well, how does logic itself function? That would be a meta logical question. Uh, and this comes up in things like math theory as well. So these kinds of questions have been dealt with and they've been asked by philosophers. And this is where it kind of bridges over into theology or, or more transcendental questions. And so, since there there's not really a test tube or microscope type of proof for something like a law of logic or something like a mathematical principle or something like the self or the soul, what we end up finding is that all of those things kind of kind of get stuck in this category of the immaterial or the spiritual or the conceptual or the ideal. Uh, or whatever kind of terms you want to use to describe it, that by the nature of what they are, they can't be demonstrated or proven empirically. So we might think, well, then we're in a quandary. We can never prove those things. We can never know those things. And a lot of people have gone down that route. I don't think so. I think that if you look, for example, at the way Aristotle responded to the sophists when they, they asked him this question, they said, well, how can you prove the law of non-contradiction as true. In other words, if, what if I come along and I say as a skeptic, Aristotle, well, I just don't accept your law of non-contradiction. I think that it's a fraud. 
Aristotle responds by saying, well, I can prove to you that even in the process of your denying the law of non-contradiction, you're still assuming it. So you're still using logic and rules and laws uh, about reasoning in the process of denying laws about logic and reasoning. So you're already involved in a contradiction. And so in other words, he says, this is a transcendental category. It's a, it's a something that's a precondition for uh, logic, precondition for argumentation, period. And so just because it's not demonstrated in the same way that other things are demonstrated doesn't mean that it's not true or provable or certain. And so in the same way, things like God uh, or things like the self are transcendental preconditions for experience. Uh, now, somebody might say, oh, well, you're just using Kant. No, actually, again, this goes back pre-Kantian. It's not Kant. Kant took these kind of ideas and then kind of turned that into a thing where he said, oh, uh, you know, the mind is the transcendental category that, that orders everything, and, and everything is really just a manifestation of our mind. I don't believe that. I believe there's a there's a common, you know, objective external world that we all experience. It's not just my mind that's creating all this reality. It's not solipsism. In other words, Kantianism, you know, devolves back into solipsism. So anyway, this is a long answer to your question. And that is just simply to say that I think that what would, ha what would have to happen is a reorienting of the way that we think about the self and logic and immaterial and conceptual entities and understanding that they're they're they are actually more fundamental than our empirical quote material experience in a, of, of life i don't think i'm not saying that material phenomena don't exist but i'm saying that i believe that uh, reality is not atomism it's not materialism um it's it, most of what we experience is basically energy that's just sort of in different forms uh it's not I mean, we're just so entrained to think of the world as matter. Uh, and this is really, again, part of that Newtonian propaganda and the, the promotion of Newtonian atomism, which is, again, a, a worldview. It's a presupposition. Uh, and until you question Newtonian presuppositions, you don't really think outside of these paradigms. And so I don't think anybody's going to have a whole lot of success with demonstrating those kinds of things until they reorient and start thinking in a transcendental slash presuppositional approach to things. Now, there has been, there have been philosophers and mathematicians who've already been doing this. Uh, you have Roger Penrose kind of speaking this way. You have Kurt Gerdell speaking this way with his incompleteness theorems. Uh, Husserl at times kind of speaks this way, although he's kind of uh, I would argue kind of inconsistent on how he approaches it. But you have people who are and have been kind of thinking in this this way uh but it's just kind of so foreign to people and it's it seems a little obtuse that um i don't know that it's just one of the things that i try to to get across to people and if i can ever get people to to view it that way i think you would you would kind of see a copernican revolution so to speak in the way that we approach epistemology and knowing things well I'll throw another name on the pile there that kind of, I think, would find a lot of agreement with you. And it's a guy named Dr. Raymond Moody, who's pretty much established as being the person who coined the term near-death experience and wrote the famous book back in the 70s. Interesting guy. He's not only in medical MD, but he also has a PhD in philosophy. So he's be akin to you and very, very well schooled in Greek philosophy as well, and speaks Greek and reads ancient Greek. And he said for a long time, I've interviewed a couple of times, he, he said he, he's kind of an interesting guy. He kind of talks in riddles sometimes, but he says it's, it's nonsensical and that we require, it requires a different system of logic to understand yes. the near death experience might even be. And he calls it pre scientific. At the same time, within the existing paradigm that we have, there's been a tremendous amount of, I think, important information about uh, this near-death experience that, one, completely undermines the materialistic understanding of consciousness, because as soon as we understand that consciousness in some way that we don't understand survives bodily death, we are completely blowing away the existing paradigm. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to talk about Raymond, because I, I just published an interview today with linguist Lisa Smart, who collaborated with Raymond Moody to do this book on 
the final words or the, the words that people speak near death. And everyone has these stories in their family, but they're also mm -hmm. backed up by hospice work and uh, many people who've seen this thing of terminal lucidity, where someone is in a coma, they've been in a coma for a year, and right before they die, they sit up and they say something either profound, like they read some poetry, or they memorize some, mm -hmm. they, have, they recite some poetry out of memory, or they even say very pragmatic things, like the documents you're going to need are in the third drawer on the left of the bureau, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So all this is well established in terms of, in the way that we do science now, we have enough evidence to say there is this other realm. And I think we're at the point where we have to start asking questions about, you know, mapping that and the typology of it. And, and one thing I want to kind of get back to is the Orthodox Christian. So, you know, that's cool. You're an Orthodox Christian. That was my childhood upbringing. I was brought up mm -hmm. in the Greek Orthodox Church. But the whole theological a uh, kind of dogma behind that. I think we have to, or this is my proposition. I want to hear what you think. I think we have to set that aside and take, you know, the few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle we have, whether it be the near death experience or, you know, Lisa's work with Raymond on these final words or, you know, any number of uh, psychic uh, medium research, you know, some good scholarly. I always quote Julie Beichel, Dr. Julie Beichel, who's, you know, done that work as well as anyone has past muster in terms of the skeptics and all that stuff. There seems to be this other realm, and I think mm -hmm. we need to try and wrap our arms around it, both the good and the bad of it, because we're going to talk freely about, you know, Luciferianism and some of the uh, malevolent uh, aspects of it. Uh, what, what What is the the landscape there and how what how might we understand it what should we rely on and what should we not and what role can some of this frontier science play in trying to understand that have you given much thought to that what i was getting at was that we already have a pretty extensive existential recording of these kinds of experiences uh, in and I'm not just uh, saying only the Orthodox tradition. Uh, I mean, there, there's a bunch of traditions that record these existential experiences of this other realm. Um, and I, and I, all I'm saying is that it's a presupposition of scientism to assume that all of those are made up or false or untrue. Uh, and I'm saying that well, if you want evidence for these kinds of things, why would you not look at, I mean, let's set aside, uh, you know, you, you have all this kind of stuff in the philokalia of the Orthodox tradition. You have uh, Seraphim Rose writing books about uh, his experiences uh, when he, I, I believe he used to meditate before he had become Orthodox. He was uh, involved in uh, Taoist meditation or something to that effect. I can't re recall exactly, but he he, you know, he talks about his experiences in the astral realm and, and what he th he thought it was and his descriptions of it. And then he became orthodox and then he you know, still had spiritual practices where he felt like he was interacting with that, that realm. Um, so, in other words, I'm saying that that's a whole bevy of evidence there that's just kind of tossed out or assumed to be irrelevant. Again, because we're all dominated by assuming that there's going to be the... the, the let me put it this way. There was a good philosopher who I like uh, named Greg Bonson. And uh, he used to argue that when we talk about things that are immaterial, you are not going to be able to quote, prove them in a material way, precisely because of the nature of what they are. So for example, the skeptic community, when it says, uh, you know, how, how are you ever going to prove God? Uh, you know, until I see God in a material fashion, I will not believe in that. So this is a kind of a common refrain that you hear from these people. And this is what Dr. Bonson called the crackers in the, in the pantry fallacy, right? And so he, his point was that if you, if I go to you know, the, the, the pantry and I opened it up and, and there's, you know, to look to see if there's crackers there, you know, that would be a, a valid way to determine whether they're is it such a thing as crackers? <laughs> but if we were to talk about something that we are saying is immaterial or conceptual in nature, 
then the way that we would go about proving or knowing the existence of that thing is not like going to the pantry and opening up to see if there's crackers there. Why? Because of the nature of what it is. We're saying that it's immaterial. So it's like, it's like, yeah, the but, atheist- but I'm not, I'm not quite so sure we, we stop there because it, it, it allows people to kind of introduce a whole bunch of ideas and, and put them all on the same level. And I don't think that's quite fair. I mean, like, let's get down to like a specific example. One of the questions I think is fundamental to everyone is, is there a moral imperative? Does consciousness have a hierarchical structure? What we're really talking about is God, okay, but we're going to flower it up and make it sound important. But that is a fundamental question. Is there a hierarchy? Is there a good? Is there a, a moral imperative? I tell you, I look at the science of this near-death experience, of the after-death communication, psychic medium accounts, all this. It comes through loud and clear that there does seem to be a moral imperative. So I, I, I think that's I think that's important. And I think it also then... Yes. It, 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 it has to be incorporated into our view of what those wisdom traditions are, because we have to dig those up and say, okay, what can we sort through? And, you know, is Christianity, uh, the, the, is the primacy of Christianity, is that valid? How do we look at that? How do we analyze that? And, and does that conform to what we're discovering here? You know, I mean, like the Dalai Lama famously has said, hey, I, I'm, I, I'm open to science. If science proves anything that we're teaching as incorrect, then it has to change. And true to form, I think they have revised some of their cosmology because it's no longer in line. Well, but maybe, again, I think I'm, I'm not being clear on what I'm saying. So I'm not disagreeing with you that there aren't uh, scientific studies or evidences regarding consciousness or uh, after death experience. I mean, I, again, I think like Rupert Sheldrake has some good arguments to show that there's kind of, uh, you know, morphogenic uh, learning that he talks about with the apes and this kind of stuff. I, but w- what I'm saying is that when you think about people and how they function, it's not just a matter of of showing them facts and evidence because that's not what's going to ultimately convince them because people are going to interpret i'm speaking more about human nature that that they're going to interpret things the way that they want to interpret them and so until we kind of undergo a process of what in the greek tradition is called metanoia which is the like changing your mind right or what you might call the awakening, right? Like you, you have to be kind of awakened out of just believing what you're told and, and believing what mainstream media says, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to be willing to move towards objectivity, right? So I think we're kind of born in an egoistic state where we, we believe everything is relative and everything is me, 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 I'm the center of the universe. And until you kind of have break from that and have some kind of awakening experience where you realize that there is objectivity, there's objective truth, right? Then you're never going to interpret the evidences that are put before you for those kinds of things accurately. So you might have like the the best killer study that shows, uh, you know, consciousness after death. And if you go and show that to, you know, a hundred people out there, most of them are going to, uh, you know, unless they're already sort of receptive to that idea like in other words let's say we go to michael Shermer's is his audience and, and he's giving a lecture on uh, materialism and that there's no consciousness after death and you have the study that shows it and you have video uh, evidence right everybody most of the people in his audience are preconditioned that they have a presupposition to discount that they're going to reinterpret what you're presenting in some other way and so all i'm saying is that there has to be a, a, a even larger cultural shift in terms of how we understand who we are and what logic is and what constitutes a proof, uh, which I think is a long time coming, uh, before there's really going to be any kind of like sea change, like a big sway. And- sure. But that might be true on a societal cultural level. But on the personal level, I think we know and see from the popularity of books and 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 the popularity of some of these memes, if you will, I hate that term, mm-hmm. but we're stuck with it, that people can undergo personal spiritual transformations, can sure. undergo personal just logical transformations yes. by looking at some of this evidence, some of this data. So, you know, what about that? Are, 
how does that inform your your view and in particular your your orthodox christian view because you know what if that doesn't conform with some of the dogma and doctrine of of your religion what do you do with that well that's a, a difficult question i mean i think that most of us i think we all have a worldview and we all have a, a we all have presuppositions and paradigms by which we interpret the world and so again i think that um my view is that we we we're constituted as humans just to kind of operate that way. So even if we don't think we have a philosophy or a worldview, we do. Uh, and so you kind of have to, I think, gr lay the groundwork first uh, and re reorient yourself, go through that process of metanoia, changing the mind and, and, and kind of spiritual transformation to where you're in a place that you can begin to interpret the world correctly. Uh, and, and I mean, I'm not trying to be arrogant, like, oh, I have it all figured out. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's, that's the approach that I take. So if you're asking me, uh, is there scientific evidence that's going to come along that will like be, be earth shattering to my perspective? I don't think so because I've, you know, I've, I've been at this for a good while of, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years now of, of researching this kind of stuff started when I was 18 or so, um, and and I, I feel like I have a decent grasp on how science works, and and but not just science, but also the levers of of power and and who's funding these studies. And you know, so if a study comes out that says, you know, and these come out all the time, you know, that uh, oh, uh, science proves that uh, Jesus never existed or something like this. I mean, I, I already know the dearth, the, the wealth of evidence that's out there you know, for what I believe that something like that's not going to like shake my paradigms. So I, I mean, let's dip into indulge me if you will for five or 10 minutes, Joe Atwell, he's been on the show a couple times, famous mythicist. Uh, I know you've kind of crossed swords with him a couple times in interesting ways. Interesting theory. I've so on our show, we not only interviewed Joe, I talked to Richard Carrier, biblical scholar, outspoken atheist, and strangely enough, you know, diametrically opposed to Atwell's theory of the Roman Empire highly influencing early Christianity. Also talked to biblical scholar Robert Price. Often also talked to Acharya S. D. Uh, D. M. Murdoch, kind of the person behind the Zeitgeist kind of idea. And also talked to biblical scholar Joel Watts, who was another outspoken uh, a critic of Atwell. And I have to tell you, just in summary. All these people who were really against Atwell and Atwell's basic thesis that it is impossible to deny the parallelism between Josephus and his book, War of the Jews, famous, uh, really Jewish, but also Roman historian, which is uh, are, are well established as one of the leading historical historians of that period. It's it's just almost impossible to deny the parallelism between his book and what appears in the Book of Mark and other Gospels and comes up there as prophecy. So I'm sure you've looked into that. W what are your thoughts? What I focus on throughout most of my 20s. So I'm I'm very familiar with all of this. And um, actually, I, I did I met uh, Joe at. Uh, one of the shows I was on, uh, I think last towards the end of last year. And, uh, we, we, we were, we're cordial. And so we kind of, I guess, uh, made things polite and civil. So we're, we're not enemies or anything, but, um, no, I, I have obviously significant disagreements with his thesis and, uh, you know, without trying to dive too deep into that topic. Um, I mean, f first of all, what can be done is, and, and this is the reason why most people trip up here is because I don't think they have a very good grasp of like the old Testament and the, the Torah and so forth. Now I know that, that Joe Atwell makes arguments from that, from Isaiah and so forth. So I'm not, I'm not negating that out offhand, but what I'm saying is that when you understand the typology from the biblical perspective, right? Not the typology that wants to kind of impose something outside of the canon of scripture onto it, what you get is that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of 
the Jewish law. So, for example, you have the high priest, and every year at the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the sanctuary and he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice onto the Ark of the Covenant. If you read the book of Hebrews, which again is written prior to 70 AD of the destruction of the temple and, and by Titus, the book of Hebrews really explains a lot of this symbolism and how it's fulfilled in Christ. And so, so when Christ ascends into the third heavens and he you know, is supposed to be our mediator in the flesh now before God, the third heavens is the fulfillment of the out of, of the temple. So the temple has three stages. It has an outer portico, it has a holy place, and then it has the Holy of Holies, which is the inner part where the, the priest went. And and Paul, presumably being the writer of Hebrews, says that, you know, that's the fulfillment of Christ's ascension, is that his, his uh, pr- uh, procession into these three stages of the heavens, right? Um, there's all kinds of things that are fulfilled in what Jesus did. He's the Paschal Lamb, right, according to uh, the book of John. Uh, and so there's all these types that are fulfilled in who Jesus is, right? And so I don't think that what Atwill argues makes any sense from the intertextual interpretation of who the Messiah is and what he would do. And, th- and again, there's there's so many examples of this that, it, that it's very difficult to even encapsulate. Like, for example, you have Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9. These all talk about the timing in which this Messiah would come. Uh, the Messiah would come, and he would set up a kingdom under the the basically what is the Roman Empire, right? And so all of this happened, and, and I don't think anybody argues that the Book of Daniel was like written <laughs> by the Roman uh, Flavian family or something like that. I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. So what I'm getting at is just that that you have all of those arguments, and then so when we when we want to read Josephus, and I've read Wars of the Jews, I know I wrote uh, papers in undergrad about. Uh, interpreting Matthew 24 and Luke 21 in light of what Josephus was talking about. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really understand how anyone makes this a Roman thing because it's perfectly in line with what was described in the Gospels, which I think were written pre-70 AD, about the destruction of the temple. So the destruction of the temple is the culmination of the Old Testament era. It's exactly what Hebrews says. It says that the the end of those sacrifices comes with the establishment of the church, the Orthodox church. Now you say, well, how, wait a minute, how do we know that it would be the Orthodox church? Well, there are, I've got a 40, 38 volume set of the church fathers for the first 700 years. And there's a whole bevy of them from Justin Martyr to Trifo, or excuse me, Justin Martyr's debate with Trifo to uh, Irenaeus to Tertullian to Cyprian uh, and these are all church fathers of the first 200 years. And you can read through their works, and they're basically saying the exact same thing that we say today. So it requires not just the mental gymnastics of kind of creative interpretation of, of a theory about uh, an oligarchic Roman family. It actually becomes a very torturous task to, to, that's made nonsensical from church fathers that no one doubts are dated in those centuries, the first, second. And, and then by the time you get to the third century, again, there's even more church fathers writing about that, uh, about all of the Orthodox theology and, and dogmas that we hold to still today. So in other words, we have the same liturgy. We have the same doctrines. It's, it, it's all there. It's not something invented, you know, in the time after, uh, you know, some dynasty that was just made up. It's not something dated to the time of Constantine that was made up. And anybody who's aware of those church fathers would know this. You know, it's, it's not really that difficult to figure out. I don't know. Like I say, we investigated this pretty thoroughly, and I took on the critics of Atwell uh, right down the line. And so I told you, you know, Richard Carrier, Robert Price, but also Christian critics like biblical scholar Joel Watts, who's an impressive, impressive guy. And well, you, actually... can, you can count me in that. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, have you have you read Irenaeus? Have you read Against Heresies? I, I have not. Okay. Have you read uh, any of Cyprian? Not like in depth, but I'll tell you the part that I find compelling. And and one is that all of these folks agree at at the end of the day that while Atwell has taken things 
kind of absurdly far in terms of the grand conspiracy that was the Roman creation of the entire Christian tradition, that his point is pretty undeniable in terms of two things. One is that most Christians don't understand who Josephus was. I mean, Josephus was a Jewish general who was co-opted by the Romans when they landed in Galilee. And he said, okay, I'll join up with you guys rather than face annihilation, face death, as many of his men did. And then his account in the War of the Jews is backed up by archaeological evidence, right? So we can go back and say, gee, when he says the walls were this thick and we dig it up and there they are. I, I, maybe you didn't understand what I was saying. No, I was, I, like getting, I was getting to what you were saying, because the, the, the point being that for hundreds of years, biblical scholars have acknowledged this parallel between the book War of the Jews and what's written in the Gospels. And there's two ways to kind of harmonize that. One is you can say kind of what you're alluding to is, well, yeah, well, you know, that's just the the miracle of uh, prophecy and all that, that it happens to conform with this book. But when we look at it from a more human standpoint, I think it's a lot easier to understand in terms of just some kind of basic things. I mean, this doesn't undermine the notion of Jesus, one that maybe Jesus was a historical figure, certainly that Christ's consciousness is real. I'm not touching any of that. I'm just focusing on this small part of the the idea that the 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 Bible needs to be understood the way that it's always been presented to us, I think is undermined by what Atwell has shown in terms of the parallels between Josephus's work and what's in the gospel. And there's just a cadre of, of biblical scholars that agree there's something going on there. You can go back to St. John Chrysostom uh, in the, the 400s, talking about Josephus's parallels to, to Jesus. So this is not a new idea. This is not something that... Uh, right. This is called preterism, and there have been theologians who've been writing about preterism for 1,500 years um, or more. So th this is not a new idea. People have been well aware of uh, Josephus's commentary on what happened in 70 AD. Uh, now, I understand what you're saying. I understand that, well, maybe we need to set aside the supernatural uh, idea and, and look at the possibility that this was a concocted um, mythology that was not really— just, just so you understand me, now, I'm not saying all of that, because I, I'm saying what, what seems to emerge is that it's this very human collection, that maybe there is a very supernatural part of it, a, a divine part of it, but then there's also a very understood from a PSYOP control standpoint as well. That's what I'm saying, that both have to be, it's an and or, not an either or. I know, but I'm saying that just even like a, a basic knowledge of how the, the biblical canon came to be from scholars across traditions that are not, that don't have an agenda. So you can look at Protestant scholars even that talk about how the canon came into formation, like F.F. F. Bruce, renowned New Testament scholar for decades. Uh, you know, his books on the formation of the canon, Lee McDonald, who's a liberal uh, his books on the formation of the canon, all of this is completely contrary to to this thesis. Okay, so we're we're not looking at uh, something that is just a thesis about uh, how or or who Jesus might have been in some seminal form, and then how it was then corrupted. It's just completely contrary to like public scholarship about what happened in the first four or five centuries that that brought the biblical canon together. And you can, again, you can read those two books, just for example, they just completely blow all this out of the water. It's just, it's, it's nonsensical. And there's plenty of other works I can recommend too. There's Biblical Apocalyptics by Milton Terry, Days of Vengeance by David Chilton. Um, the best thing on the dating of the apocalypse in those texts is uh, Ken Gentry's book, Before Jerusalem Fell, all of which are like PhD, THD, thesis level books that I think, uh, make a lot better sense of what we're talking about here. And, and again, I mean, you can't understand these things outside of, um, you know, doing your homework outside of reading these church fathers that I talked about, who, who I think make a much better coherent case for, you know, what I believe than than trying to, I mean, again, I, I, I understand what's being said. I, I know Joe's arguments. I know the, 
So what, what do you think? What do you think is being said specifically in there? And then uh, this is inside baseball, and I appreciate you indulging me. Most of the audience will probably be tuning out now, but that's okay. What do you think is being said in as narrow a focus as possible? Because I think what's being said is that the writers of Mark had access to the War of the Jews. That's what I think is being said. Okay, right. But see, the, the, the thing is, is that the we don't actually know the dating of uh, Mark, we don't know the exact date of when the Gospels were compiled. Uh, so, I mean, liberal uh, scholarship itself in the modern world, which is what a lot of this, uh, a lot of the theories about who the Gospel writers were is, is based on like the um, thesis of Julius Wellhausen of the JEPD, the Documentary Hypothesis. What's funny about the documentary hypothesis is that it's much like scientism because the modern day documentary hypothesists no longer believe the hypotheses of Julius Wellhausen. So it's, it's just as shifting and just as a, a creative endeavor of scholars trying to make a name for themselves that you can go to Yale right now, Yale's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, there's a woman professor, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she gives lectures on the documentary hypothesis in the New Testament and on Julius Wellhausen. And she talks about how that's all been discarded. We no longer believe that Q, the idea that there's Q, the modern day scholars don't believe that anymore. Now, I don't really care what the modern day scholars are because I'm not, I, I, I have a much better grounding in my worldview and in my, my, system, my belief system than to, to really, I'm not saying that academia doesn't matter. I mean, I can give you, you know, 20 books off the top of my head right now that would deal with these topics in a coherent fashion. But I'm just saying that 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 uh, they don't even believe what they believed, you know, 100 years ago. So I don't really care what uh, you know the latest theories of Q are and and this and so forth. And that I think plays into a lot of. Um, it would have to play into a lot of what's being argued here that. Uh, oh, well, since the assumption here is that Mark's gospel was early uh, and he therefore had to have, ac- whoever put it together had to have access to the words of the Jews. And so, again, it's just based on the uh, presupposition, uh, the anti- anti-supernaturalist presupposition is the, the, the basis for that argument. Now, you may want to add in supernaturalism later and say that there's some other kind of... Uh, you know, the Jesus quest type argument. But the funny thing is that all the Jesus quest stuff is funded by the UN is funded by, uh, you know, Elaine Pagels has a UN backing. So all of her stuff is in my view, bogus Bart Ehrman stuff is all, uh, has a political agenda as well. Um, and that's why you see these people arguing for feminism and, you know, feminist theology and all this nonsense. Well, he's part of academia. He's not going to be separate from all of that stuff. Correct. I guess what it gets down to, let's try and tie it back to Jay's analysis. I mean, because someone who listens to your to your shows and gets that, and there's a ton of stuff we haven't talked about, the whole uh, occulted... Uh, so what, I want to make one more point, though. Again, yes, this, go ahead. This is very crucial to, to Atwell's thing. The preterist argument, which is the idea that most of what you're seeing in uh, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, and Luke 21 about the last days, and even the Book of the Apocalypse, which I referenced, uh, Days of Vengeance by David Chilton, uh, uh, those books don't stand alone. A lot of what's in the Apocalypse is out of text from Isaiah and out of text from Ezekiel, and they're, they're out of text from uh, Daniel. Uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21 reference Daniel 7 many times. Daniel 7 is a prediction of when the Messiah would come. And, it, uh, and then into chapters 11, it references the abomination of desolation. Jesus quotes this in Luke 17. So what I'm saying is that you, it, it's not like you can build this thesis just on these New Testament chapters and say that it will, oh, it coincides with Josephus, because no one will argue that Josephus was around in the days of Daniel. Josephus was not around in the days of Isaiah, when you have many of the I, same I get prophecies. Your point. Yeah, many of the same arguments are made. And again, that's because 70 AD was the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. What does Luke say? Luke's, Luke says in his gospel, these are the days of vengeance in which all things written in the prophets must be fulfilled. And I think that that's what 70 AD was. That's what the book of the apocalypse is talking about. It's talking about the end of that era. Uh, you know, that's why John says these things are, are soon to come to pass. It, the, the whole period of the Mosaic, the Adam, Adamic to the Mosaic to the Davidic, that's all fulfilled in this character of Christ. 
and that's why 70 AD was so important. I, I get that, and and that's the the Christian explanation for it, and that's not being derogatory, but it's that you know again the parallels are pretty undeniable it's a you can line them up point by point and it appears to be following the exact sequence of josephus and then you're saying well from a broader kind of spiritual in ways that we don't understand perspective there's other prophecies that would tie into it that makes it impossible if the argument if the argument is that the gospel writers uh were writing from josephus i'm saying that it's big it's a bigger problem because what the gospel writers are not just quoting Josephus. A lot of these things come out of the Old Testament. Even Josephus, even Josephus says that the uh, destruction of Jerusalem seems, in some way, to kind of be a covenantal curse upon Israel. Now, he obviously he doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't think that it was for the rejection of the Messiah. What I'm saying is that if you read the book of Deuteronomy, well, he thinks know, Titus is the Messiah. I mean, that's what Josephus believes. I mean, that's his whole. That's his whole conversion, right? He's in the cave, and he tells everybody, okay, we all have to commit suicide. And then he has incredible revelation, goes, hey, wait a minute. We were all wrong. Our whole Judaic tradition had it wrong. The Messiah is here. It's Caesar. Caesar is the Messiah. Let's go. And that's what he that's what he, he lives and writes for the rest of his life. So, I mean, that's Joseph. Again, the, the, a real quick way to dispel this is that there, there are 300 years of persecution of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, so the idea that... Uh, that no, but this is what Joseph... I mean, that's that's not controversial. This is what Josephus First writes. All, I don't I don't recall Josephus saying that. I mean, that's probably a theory about the Qumran community and uh, the no, Dead Sea Scrolls. No, I mean, that's... Well, um, I'm pretty sure that's what Josephus writes in his 20,000... Okay, well, I mean, I wrote a paper so much. about this, a grad-level paper 10 years ago, uh, dealing with... Wars of the Jews and Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I'm just saying, uh, I, I, again, if, if you if you haven't read, you know, the patristic literature from the first three centuries and you haven't looked into, you know, the fact that the church was persecuted for the first 300 years by the Roman Empire. I mean, this thesis is really kind of ridiculous. Well, yeah. You know, I would say when people say you haven't read it, it's a, a, a familiarity with it. But, you know, we can all read things and get different things. But I get your point. Here, Here's the way I think it ties back to the question that really sent this off is that I, I think what we're struggling with in terms of trying to understand what's going on, which is in a very broad sense, what you're trying to do on Jay's analysis, what you're trying to do with esoteric Hollywood and saying, is there some uh, occulted um, religious or occulted spirituality, be it good or bad, that lies behind all this? I, I think it's important to know what someone's starting point is, you know, and, and how that starting point has been developed. And I think you're saying over and over again that you're very comfortable with your Orthodox Christian uh, historical Jesus being your map of that extended sure. consciousness realm. And I'm saying, gee, I keep stumbling into science and well as well as other evidence that calls that into question. I'll leave you with one more and then we that kind of gets us back on track. Well, I would be glad to debate any of these topics. Uh, you know, I've done public debates with Adam Kokesh and, and you know prominent people. So I, I if you want to have a debate or if anybody else wants to debate it, that's fine with me. I, I, hey, man, I think that's great. And I, th well, I think that's kind of what we're doing here. I mean, we're fleshing out these issues. I agree with so much. I mean, I, I broadly okay, but, agree. But I mean, look, look, I, I want to stress that it, it, this whole thing hinges on, I, I'm assuming, you know, the first three centuries. OK, uh, I mean, maybe there's some other argument I'm not aware of. But again, all you have to do is read these church fathers from the first three centuries who are placed throughout the Roman Empire, uh, who are persecuted. And they they all write and teach the same thing that we teach. And I mean, I think that really undercuts the absurdity of this whole view. Okay, well, here, let me come at it from a different angle. You know, I just interviewed this guy, 88 year old Anglican priest. Uh, his name is Michael Cox, right? From all outward appearances, just a beautiful spiritual being. Uh, Oxford trained, uh, very well versed, very a very Christian guy. I mean, he's not he's a progressive tr Christian, but he's certainly not, you know, 
fringe out there uh, saying stuff that is completely outside of the doctrine. Anyways, his experience is for the last 40 years in a very synchronistic, almost impossible to explain way, encountered these people that claim to have this spiritual dilemma because they claim to be channeling Stephen the Martyr. Okay. So he's extremely skeptical. Cox is at the beginning. He's like, this goes against a lot of the things he's been trained, a lot of the things he knows. But he's also, like I said, an Oxford trained theologian, and he knows his stuff. And he then tries to test this channeled entity by asking all these questions about early Greek and, uh, and, 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 and all this investigation into the Athenian wine tradition versus, you know, all this stuff that no one, especially this couple from Kent, who's, I don't want to say they're not educated, but they're certainly not educated in that way. They would have no way of knowing. So this guy has this 40 years of experience. Like I say, he's 88 years old and uh, he has a different belief about how to process his Christian experience. And it's much more open. It's much more broadly, I don't want to say, uh, spiritual, if you will, spiritual, but not religious. The big tent Christianity, a very big tent where, hey, my reality of Christianity might be true, but it certainly doesn't exclude all these other experiences of the divine, the experiences of God, the experiences of spirit. In in a broad sense, Jay, what do you think about that? Well, obviously, I don't know this individual, so I don't know. Right, but you get the point. Many diving boards into the pool rather than the primacy of Christianity. Okay. Uh, let me just say from the outset that, that I think one of the things that is unique to the approach that I take, which I, I believe to be more consistent with the tradition that I believe, um, is that we don't make a divide between reason, logic, uh, objectivity, evidence, science, uh, and theology. This is another presupposition of the modern world that that that's like the realm of uh, the leap of faith and it's all fuzzy and we don't really know, but then you know we have hard science over here on the other side. I don't believe that. Um, you can actually read a lot of prominent Orthodox theologians who will kind of explode that notion. So what I'm going to say to that is, number one, uh, I don't have no idea if this uh, person is really channeling someone. Um, if they are, and they claim to be channeling uh, some spirit, that's obviously completely contrary to the Orthodox tradition. And uh, Stephen the Martyr, Martyr is you know, part, of, part of our tradition as well as the first thousand years of Western Christianity. So that's completely contradictory and incoherent to you know what what uh, the the Orthodox tradition is, the Christian tradition is. So no, so that makes absolutely no sense. It'd be like saying, "Oh, I've talked to Lucifer and he's a good guy now." Uh, so let's rewrite our theology. I mean, you, we don't determine our theology based on uh, some random person's existential experiences. And you're saying that the contradiction is that channeling spirits is not something that you could accept, kind of thing. Is that the the rub, if you will? I, I'm not saying that it's not real. I'm saying that uh, number one, why would you believe a spirit? I mean, I mean, everybody wants to sort of laugh and sort of mock at what's in the Bible, but the Bible has said for you know millennia that uh, channeling spirits is real and the spirits lie. Uh, so if you want to believe the spirits, then you know that that's on you, and I think it's pretty foolish. Or it's just a bunch of fraud and scammery. So I you know I have no I have no way of knowing which it is. Right. But, and, and then how, so here is really the crux of it, right? So how might one investigate that in a way that, that you could accept in a, in a scientific way, if you would, back to the very beginning of this long discussion that you've been very gracious about? I, I do appreciate it because I, I know some of this stuff is challenging. But if, if one wanted to explore whether or not that's true or false, see, this is the problem I think people have. It's that, well, if it's just a, a, a doctrinal thing that, well, here's the book and the book says all these things are bad, you know, that seems unsatisfying to a lot of we people. We don't believe that our book, it's, that it's just some law book, an external rule book that, uh, you know, you, you check off the check, checklist. The book is uh, uh, the means by which you have an existential relationship with God. Uh, so we don't put a divide. We don't. We don't. We don't get put into dialectics. At least that's our goal: is to not be put into faith versus reason, objectivity versus subjectivity. Orthodox theology is all about kind of transcending dialectics. So we wouldn't say that um, 
the, the reason why uh, something is wrong is just simply because it's in a rule book, but rather that the rule book reflects the, the architecture of the world itself. Uh, so if God created the world, and I think he did, and he kind of set these rules and boundaries and principles in play for a reason, the rule book is merely a reflection of, you know, like, you know, you tell your, uh, your kid not to put his hand on the stove. There's a reason why it's not just because you're being arbitrary or capricious. It's because you, you don't want the, him to, you know, harm himself by putting his hand on the eye of the stove. Right. Uh, and we view it the same way. I mean, the, you know, the, the principles that are in scripture are there for our good. Uh, and they are actually health and life as Psalm 110 says. So, so when you're contacting spirits, you know, you just look at uh, Second Samuel when, um, or excuse me, First Samuel 16 or 17, whenever it is, when uh, Saul goes and tries to contact spirits and he goes to the witch of Endor and she pulls up the spirit for him and, uh, you know, Saul gets cursed and it leads to, to suicide. So I believe that's there for a reason as a principle to, to warn us. Now, if you want to be adventurous and risk you know, these kinds of things, that's, that's, uh, that's your decision. But uh, I would say it would be very foolish to do that. Just, just in the same way as, uh, you know, people who do drugs or LSD or these kinds of things or for, for spiritual purposes, uh, you're just being foolish. And I can say that from, I can say that from experience. I've done LSD many times. I know what happens. I have a direct existential experience of the whole phenomena. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm speaking from, you know, from, I speak from experience, not just from a quote rule book. Right. But, but Jay, that's why I brought up the case of Michael, because I think it does bring into sharp contrast what we're talking about here. The 88 years old Anglican priest who. That really, is, that's really irrelevant, though, because you're asking a question. Well, no, that's, you're asking it's a not, question about, about something being morally true or spiritually true or good. Uh, and you're trying to like kind of you're kind of stacking on like these other things about him being ADA and this guy, but then they realize that's really irrelevant to the uh, truth. That that'd be like saying, well, Joe Atwell's, uh, you know, he's he's studied this for a long time, therefore it's true. But, and that really has nothing to do with it. Well, it, it's not that it it's not that cut and dried, is it? Right? I mean, we can't completely uh, bow to authority, and at the same time, we all in our regular life. Uh, look to people that have investigated things. And from a scientific standpoint, you know, this gets back to something that we kind of talked about early on. Part of the atheistic, materialistic kind of shell game is to say that experience doesn't matter and that people's That's true. experience totally can't be counted. And, and, and what I think what I think we can do, and again, the other thing that they'll, they'll do with something like uh, Michael's experiences, they'll say, well, that's anecdotal. You know, that's just a one-off. And of course, that's nonsense as well, because if we collect enough of these anecdotal accounts, they no longer become anecdotal. They become a body of evidence that can be analyzed with all the scientific tools. So it, True. The, yeah. the, the real point, I think, with uh, Michael's case and the reason that I bring him up and keep stressing that he's a 88-year-old Anglican priest for Oxford trained is his starting point was very similar to yours, right? And it still is. He's not. He's not someone who's, uh, you know, saying we need to completely diverge from the Bible. And, and he's not someone who went out seeking uh, this kind of spiritual encounter, right? I mean, just if you understand the, understand the story and you don't, but I mean, he had he was counseling someone who came to him and said, "Hey, I don't know what to do with this because." This this thing is happening. This husband and wife says that this husband's this wife says my husband's waking up in the middle of the night. And he said, you know, his first reaction was to say, hey, this is bad. We shouldn't do this. But then he, he tested he, and he'll quote you. You know, if you there's no need to debate here. Hey, have you ever read accounts of exorcisms? I mean, I don't understand why this doesn't just sound like something dark. I mean, I, again, I don't know this case, but that's what I'm saying. It doesn't to Michael. Michael's familiar with all of that. Michael ha has, will quote you scripture after scripture in the same way that you do to say that, you know, this is the way to kind of proceed. And this is the way to properly test the spirits and that we have a long tradition of these kind of communications, whether we call them channeling or not. So, I mean, but, but the, the, reason the, the real point, the real points, if we can pull it outside of this, which is what I'm trying to do here, is to say, how can we know what we know? And I'm uncomfortable with the, the idea that we can't know this stuff in any way other than 
uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm following a certain doctrine, then I can't step out of my doctrine. I can't dare kind of challenge that because it's going to conflict with what I already know and I'm certain of. And I just don't think that's the way things are progressing. Well, <laughs> scientifically. Okay. Okay, so just because you can experience or investigate something, uh, does it? It doesn't necessarily mean that you should. I mean, so for example, let's right. say that let's say that I could have an extremely intense, maybe even spiritual experience by taking some uh, very hardcore drug uh, that might mess me up. I mean, why would you do that? I mean, it's just, it just seems foolish to me. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, maybe if you you're you're a, a a sucker for danger or something and you, and you just want you you're out for the thrills right i mean it, I, I just don't get the argumentation here of, of why what what you're what i'm supposed to be getting from this that that you, you feel like uh, a revealed text would limit you in what could be could be um experienced uh but yeah i mean but i think that limits are good i mean we all have limits you put limits on your children like, what would you, if your son turned to you and said, Hey dad, I think you're being a jerk and you won't let me, you know, play out in the street and you won't let me. Every day he says, both of them say that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I view God as a, a wise father, a protector. I don't think that, uh, and, and again, I, it's not just rule book. It's based on my own experiences. I mean, at the times that I have, you know, decided to do whatever the heck I wanted to in my life. And I just don't care about this stuff anymore. I always end up regretting that i always spend up you know oh man i shouldn't have you know had that one night stand i shouldn't have you know done that acid you know back when i was 18 or 19 that you know it, it was a very dangerous thing to do um you know so i guess in a way i learned from the experiences but i think it's just foolhardy to to think that you can play with spiritual forces and um you know that this that this is a realm for for just sort of playing around our our souls our our psyches are not made for for playing around i think that you know i mean i'm not trying to be dour or puritanical here uh, we're, we're not puritans but um again you can read many many people in our tradition who have for many years experienced this stuff and dealt with it in reality like father seraphim rose um who, who detail these experiences and you know i just think you have to be careful and it's not something that i would do okay I tell you what, we've we've hammered that into the ground and probably lost a lot of people, which is uh, unfortunate because I want to bring it back. To I don't. You. I don't know. I mean, I, when I post this, I, I guarantee this is going to get a lot of views. Okay, we'll see. We'll see what is also going to get a lot. You, you know what? Uh, uh, related to that, you know, I heard a really interesting point you made. You said, "Hey, I'd love to talk about philosophy and theology more, but let's face it: when I post a, a movie analysis, it's kind of an easier entry point, and I get a lot more views." Sure. Uh, I just found that found that interesting. If you want to comment on that, and and what you face as kind of a publisher in terms of where you draw the line and, and, and how you keep your audience staying with you and at the same time cover topics that are really important to you? Well, it's kind of easy because, uh, you know, I like film and I've always liked film, so I can always write on that topic, you know, to kind of make sure that the, the engine's running. <clears throat> uh, but most of the, the essays and articles at my site are not movies. <laughs> the majority of them are, are philosophy and theology and geopolitics and some satire and goofy stuff. Uh, and I think there's only about 120 or 30 film reviews. So, um, but the film review stuff has really, has really taken off and has a great audience. And you were telling me at the beginning that it's even spawned a TV series that you're involved with, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, that's what led to the book and then that's what led to, you know, the TV show. So you're right about that. I mean, it, it, it definitely is the, the, like I said, it's the engine of the website, but I don't really have a plan the way I do. I just kind of go with what I'm into, what I feel like writing about what's uh, maybe what's trending, what movies are coming out, you know, like aliens coming out. And so I've been writing and talking about uh, Ridley Scott stuff lately. Um, but yeah, so the TV show will be uh, me and Jay Weedner, who's, kind of known for his uh, Kubrick documentaries. And uh, we got together and basically put together a, um, 
I think we're going to do 17 episodes for the first season, which is covering a lot, not everything in my book, but some of the stuff that's in my book. So we're going to be dealing with uh, Blade Runner, the Alien series, X-Files, Eyes Wide Shut, 2001 Space Odyssey, a lot of that kind of stuff for the first 17 episodes. And then uh, if that does well, we'll um, they'll order up another 22 episodes. And this will be on uh, the Gaia Network, which is streaming and it's also on uh, apple tv roku amazon prime and i think on some uh, satellite and cable networks too you know you were telling me high production value kind of a siskel and ebert thing Mm -hmm. do do you have a lot of clips and stuff like that that really we do yeah that that took me about a month to uh get all the clips together for the first season and it was a lot of work because you have to you know kind of get everything passed through lawyers and you have to tell them what you're going to say it's exciting. I can't wait to watch it. What is the release date for that? Is that? Uh, well, I mean, we're just in production now, and so it'll probably be in the post-production process for a few months. So it'll probably, I don't know, three three months from now, maybe. Um, you know, if you if you follow my work, you know, obviously I'll I'll be promoting it pretty heavily, so you'll know. <laughs> okay. But uh, um, yeah, I don't I don't have any exact date on that, but uh, but yeah, no, we have a. I I, I was kind of blown away when I flew up there uh, last week and walked into the studio and they have this big warehouse that's you know it's got several sets in it and then this is this giant projector with uh uh a big a big fancy theater in the background and then it's it's jay and i kind of sitting in director's chairs you know kind of face to face and then and we kind of go back and forth and um it's it's an exchange process you know it's like uh, we play the clip and then you know he comments i comment uh, there'll probably be some disagreements and kind of debate at times, which will be fun. And, um, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right. It's basically Cisco and Ebert on acid is how I put it. <laughs> on acid. It, it, w- tell me this. What about, uh, book projects, super successful with esoteric Hollywood, any, any follow up to that or other bro- book projects coming? Well, out? I mean, you know, there's probably three or four books worth of material at my, at my site already written. So, I mean, it, I guess I've just kind of been waiting to see uh, what would happen. It's only been four months, so I'll probably probably just wait and see what happens and um, maybe do a sequel or, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of branch out into some other territory and, uh, you know, I might put something out to dealing with metaphysics and philosophy and that kind of stuff too just because, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy film, but I don't, you know, that's not my whole life. I don't, I don't only want to be, uh, you know, writing on movies. So I, so I'd like to do some other stuff. So, you know, maybe, maybe something, uh, philosophy related. Well, that certainly comes through in the website. Anyone who goes to Jay's analysis, I would say, you know, everyone's going to find something that they like there, but that's not really the case, but you will find just a whole variety of stuff. Like we've talked about from geopolitics, metaphysics, all sorts of stuff. So, you're really to be congratulated. So glad that that voice of yours is out there. And our guest again has been Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. And Jay just... Dude, I would say too, there's a vast archive. I think people, maybe they don't realize that they're new to it. I mean, there's years of, uh, you know, hundreds of articles. Oh, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And prepping for this interview, I was like, gee, where do you, where do you begin? Yeah. And, and, you know, seven or eight years ago, it was just kind of me just throwing up blog posts. And then it kind of turned into doing a little bit of audio interviewing. And then it turned into longer form interviews. And then it turned into longer essays. And then it turned into, you know, video type stuff. And I guess that's just kind of the natural progression of of what happens in alternative media. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's over a hundred essays. There's, um, or excuse me, a hundred interviews on audios that you can listen to. There's, I forget how many video reports I've done now in the last year. And then there's, you know, there's, there's a wealth of stuff there. Well, great. And, and, and you may not agree, but you'll, you'll definitely be challenged, I think. And that's what I like to do is, is just really challenge people to think that's kind of the goal of the philosopher. You know, that's what Socrates was doing was going around kind of just challenging people to think. Absolutely. Absolutely. As, as is on this show, we kind of have the skeptical principle question everything mm-hmm. in the Hindu tradition. It's netty, 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 not this, not this, not this. Uh, in a way, you're engaging in a similar kind of uh, kind of broad minded look at a lot of things. Again, great work. And thanks so much for joining me. All right. And if you would just get the book from me. <laughs> OK. Yes. Again, for folks and a sign, sign copy can't be correct. That. Yeah, That's a pretty cool copies. deal. 
Thanks again to Jay Dyer for joining me today on Skeptico. I guess the one question I tee up from this interview is the one that I teed up in the opening clip. Are some atheists secretly peddling an occulted, watered-down, satanic, or Luciferian theology? Is that, in some respects, their end game? So that's the question. I'd love to hear any comments you might have. Of course, the place to do it is through the Skeptico website. And hey, by the way, while you're at the website and you might want to check out the Skeptico Forum, I always encourage people to do that. And the Skeptico Forum has a new kind of cool index that Laird, one of the Skeptico Forum members, created. So I want you to check that out, too, because he did a really nice job on it, and I appreciate it. There's a link in the show notes to the index that Laird created. As I mentioned previously, I do have a couple of interesting follow-ups, I think, to this interview. They'll be coming out in the near future, and I have a number of other interesting shows as well. I do hope you stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care, and bye for now. 